Um, we are kind of done with all the lecture material for module two on gene regulation. So I want to give a quick summary or review of uh, this second module. We started with introducing transcription regulation, um, how transcription factor binding at the promoters or enhancers uh, and interact with the polymerase at the transcription start site to kick off the polymerase to start elongating and uh, start transcription. And in order to really um, find transcription factor motifs in the genome, we or, or your input sequence, say a group of co-expressed genes, um, we first need to understand how transcription factor motifs are represented. This can either be represented as a regular expression, with, which is just a string, AC, AC, G, G, T, something like that, or a sequence logo, which gives you a probabilistic uh, model for how likely a transcription factor is, is uh, recognizing this sequence or not. Um, and there are known transcription factor motif databases, for example, from Jasper, Homer, Factor Book, and probably the most comprehensive one now is Hokomoko. Um, for de novo motif finding, um, depending on the regular, uh, the, the motif representation, for regular expression, you can use uh, methods such as Weeder, for which um, use uh, like a kind of Kamer enrichment and also suffix uh, tree to identify the motif enrichment or occurrence. For a position weight matrix update, um, we this is mostly uh, we introduced either expectation maximization and a, a Gibb sampler. And in both approach, there are two major parameters in the model. One is the motif probability matrix, now similar to this uh, sequence logo. The other one is based on that, you know, where does this motif occur in your input sequence, the location of the motif occurrence. Um, for these two parameters, given one, you can actually get the information for the other. But at the beginning, we don't have information on either. So um, we just randomly initialize the motif matrix and then um, try to use the input sequence to uh, gradually update these parameters iteratively. The difference between expectation maximization and Gibbs sampler is EM is a deterministic approach for gradient descent to find a local maximum, whereas Gibbs sampler is a stochastic process from sampling, which um, will enrich in the sequence that are um, motifs that are appearing more frequently than expected. And both can you know, give you some interesting result and but despite the uh, stochastic process i think uh, both for both process you want to uh, maybe restart a number of times um so these kind of algorithm worked quite well um in bacteria and the yeast uh, maybe in, in c elegans but for um vertebrate genomes zebrafish or, or mouse or human those methods don't work very well because the coding sequence is only like two percent you know, the remaining 98% of the genome can all potentially code for um, transcription factor motif binder binding sites, which is just too, too long and uh, too big a search space. So um, people try to use evolutionary conservation, phase counts conservation score to narrow down the input sequences. They can also look at the same motif that appear in proximity to each other, or even different motifs, you know, combinatorial motifs that are appearing in proximity to each other to reduce the search space and improve signal to noise. But what really worked well in understanding transcription factor motif or transcription factor binding sites is uh, the new technique at ChIP-seq. And, um, and so basically, uh, this is a way to use antibody against a particular transcription factor to find genome-wide where this transcription factor bind in a particular cell condition. And you end up with a FASTQ file. Uh, and sometimes you might have even an input control as the, as the control and the chip seek for the enrichment. And so for analysis, you can run BWA to do read mapping, max for P calling. For quality control, you can look at you know, whether you have a lot of redundant read, um, whether the read is kind of fairly evenly distributed across the genome. 
um, you can look at, you know, for the max peak call, how many peaks pass the FDR cutoff and have a fold change, say, above twofold. That's a pretty important QC. You probably want, you know, few thousand to tens of thousands of peaks. You can also look at fraction of reads in peaks, the FIP score, which kind of give you the, the signal to noise of your, your peaks. And um, you can also look at the peak locations to see whether they overlap with uh, DNA hypersensitive regions in, uh, from previous data. Um, also to look at promoter enhancer or exon enrichment distribution. Uh, finally, the motif, sorry, the, the peak regions should be in evolutionarily fairly conserved region and also are enriched in the motif of your, of your TF um, based on the, say, the family, you know, this type of, this family of transcription factors always, uh, say, GATA motif is GATA, and do you see that GATA motif enriched in the data? Um, for after the peak calling, um, we, we know that ChIP-seq actually give us very good uh, knowledge of what this transcription factor might be interacting with because the interaction might really influence the role of this transcription factor, you know, what pathways, what, uh, what it really does to regulate nearby genes. And so um, for that, you can either use motif an analysis to look at what other motifs are also enriched in the TF of interest. And so for that, you can use yeah, Homer or meme or Systrom, or um, you can look at the ChIP-seq overlap with previously generated ChIP-seq in the public. And for that, you can use Systrom DB to see your peak sets uh, has, you know, what are the significant overlap with other ChIP-seq to guess, okay, my, my transcription factor might be interacting with another factor of interest. And um, because the motif and the ChIP-seq for the same family of transcription factors, usually they, there are significant peak overlaps. So you might also need to use expression data to help you really fine tune the specific a member of the transcription in the family, um, you know, whether it's GATA3 interacting with FOXA1 or whether it's GATA5 interacting with FOXA1 and so on. Um, and then another important task to do is to look at um, transcription factor direct to target genes. And so for that, um, based on the ChIP-seq binding peaks, you first can generate a regulatory potential, which is kind of the weighted number of binding sites near this transcription start site of this gene. Um, and weighted by the distance. And so here we found that as long as you cut off by you know, twofold change, pretty much all the peaks uh, nearby are important weighted by the, the distance. Um, and the, the, the binding strength, you know, whether it's a fivefold or tenfold or 50 fold probably doesn't matter as much, but you could weigh by the epigenetic signal, such as the level of K27 acetylation in that particular binding site. That, you know, the, the, the reads in that peaks actually matter. Uh, you can also use DNAs or ataxic signals near that or in, in on that particular binding site. Um, you could also consider the TAD boundaries or um, we, because we know that um, if say you have uh, say these two binding sites nearby, if purely by distance, this binding site that's close to the transcription start site should have a stronger effect. However, if there is a CTCF binding which or a TAD boundary right here, which uh, is kind of insulating the ChIP-seq binding to the transcription start site, that might have some effect. So even this binding site that's a little further away might have a stronger effect on this gene. Whereas the other one, which is kind of outside the TAD is no longer influencing the the expression of this gene. You can also use high c data to see what kind of, uh, you know, promoter enhancer are, are interacting with each other. Although high c data for enriching promoter enhancer interaction, so far, we don't really have very good resolution to loop, to link the promoter to the enhancer, at least for most of the TF binding sites, you just don't have enough resolution. Um, so these are coming from the, you know, the binding, these are coming from epigenetics. Also, we look at the differential expression. Uh, when the factor is active versus inactive, what differential genes are, are there? And then by linking the regulator potential and the differential expression, you can do a rank product to get the, the strongest direct targets to the weakest. And with that gene ranking, you can cut out the top ones for gene ontology analysis or gene set enrichment analysis. 
Um, and then uh, because we see that the same transcription factor in different cells can bind to very different locations, this opened up the question that epigenetics might play an important role in this deciding um, where a particular transcription factor would really bind in a particular cell condition. And so there are different levels of epigenetics. The very first level uh, is DNA modification directly, uh, which is uh, DNA methylation. And this is kind of a dynamic process. You can methylate the DNA, you can also demethylate the DNA. And in the cell, we usually just get a snapshot. And for that, you know, we talk about a bisulfite sequencing, but there are also other um, way to just enrich for the regions that are, are have DNA methylation and just sequence that. Um, also, uh, for that, you can, you know, again, look at read mapping, you can look at the uh, the, the percentage of methylation in each particular location and uh, uh, at, at least see where DNA are methylated in general. And what we see is that DNA methylation in a particular cell conditions are usually dichotomous. In a pure cell, um, in this region, is either mostly methylated or mostly unmethylated. Um, and um, the, the exception is in printed region where the mom copy and the dad copy of the two chromosomes um, are, are differentially methylated. And that's only 80, around 80 or 100 regions across all the genome. So it's most of the regions are most of the, you know, the, are, are consistent for the same cell type. And also it spreads, you know, once the methylation enzyme is, is in this location, it will try to spread the DNA methylation to the nearby region. So even if you don't have enough read coverage to estimate a specific location, you can, you know, do a window average to get a rough idea whether this region is methylated or not. In terms of the function of DNA methylation, it's generally considered a suppressive effect. Um, it's, you know, it, it, a lot of the repeat region, about half of the genome are, are DNA methylated. Um, they kind of suppress those regions from transcribing, uh, say, viral genome incorporation locations or uh, yeah, LTRs. These, these are kind of like fossils from previous viral infections and things like that. So you want to DNA methylate those regions to cover them up. Uh, CPG islands are usually enriched in the promoters of genes. And when the DNA methylation, uh, when DNA is methylated in those CPG islands, the nearby genes are usually not uh, expressed. Whereas the, if DNA is not methylating the promoter of the CPG island of the gene, the gene is usually expressed. Um, for gene body, interestingly, we see that the highly expressed genes, their gene body, are sometimes methylated. And uh, this kind of prevents the polymerase to start from the wrong place to make sure that they, they correctly start at the transcription start site and then elongate across the gene, uh, the gene body. Um, enhancer can also be methylated. And uh, when the enhancer has DNA methylation, very often transcription factors cannot bind to that region. So you can see in general, DNA methylation suppress binding, suppress gene expression, suppress transcription start site from going to those locations. And there are many um, cases where DNA methylation you know, goes awry, misregulation in this, uh, especially for, for example, in cancers. Uh, what we see is that globally, the repeat regions, the re or the uh, these you know repeat regions are less methylated. So you see a lot of re you know LTR um, regions being transcribed, and also in the specific CPG islands, you sometimes see a high per methylation. So the genes that could be expressed are no longer expressed, so they get suppressed, and so that's DNA methylation. The next unit of epigenetics is uh, nucleosome, right? So this uh, is 146 base pair of DNA wrapped two rounds around eight histones. And the, these nucleosomes very often can prevent transcription factor from binding. And so the position of the nucleosome is important. Um, and they can kind of slide along the DNA. And there are cis effect, which means the GC rich sequence like to you know, interact with the histone, whereas the AT rich sequence likes to face outside of the nucleosome. And there are also trans effects, which is specific transcription factors can actually go there and squeeze, you know, the pioneering factors can go there and squeeze out the transcript, uh, the, the nucleosome. But once they bind there, they help 
the nearby nucleosome to be better positioned. And if you look at across many, many cells, then suddenly you see this very strong, you know, plus one nucleosome, plus two nucleosome, and then gradually it becomes less positioned. And so with the histone in place, then we can have histone modifications, right? So, so the dif different histone tails can be modified. And depending on whether um, it's, uh, you know, H3, K4 trimethylation or K27 trimethylation or, or a K K36 methylation or a acetylation, depending on the different modification, they might have different effect. Um, and also there are enzymes that are involved to read the histone mark, or write the mark, or erase the mark, or, or like place the nucleosomes. Yeah, these are very, very important epigenetic regulators. And so we can use uh, chip seek data against the histone marks and also against the enzyme that read, write, or erase the histone marks or DNA methylations to really figure out what actions are, what, you know, the, these are kind of the molecular beacons in the genome to help uh, factors identify which location in the genome are more interesting. And so, um, yeah, they provide a landmark for TF binding. Um, and you can use the availability of histone mark uh, profiles in a particular cell to identify new genes such as non-coding genes, to identify the important genes such as the bivalent genes, super enhancer genes, or super promoter genes. Um, you can also use histone mark across the genome, different histone mark combinations, signals along the genome to segment the genome into these are promoters, these are enhancers, these are gene body in, uh, or insulator regions in the genome. And also use the dynamics of histone marks such as K27 acetylation or K4 monomethylation to infer what transcription factor binds there and how they regulate nearby genes. And for that, um, we always integrate epigenetics with gene expression analysis to see, oh, when the histone mark is higher, uh, you know, does that really influence nearby gene expression? Um, and then we also discuss um, the um, DNA's hypersensitivity or ataxy, and th these two are different approaches, both for uh, profiling chromatin accessibility. More and more people are adopting a taxi because the technique is really, really simple and fast to do, easy. Um, and they give you kind of a pretty high resolution mapping of all the transcription factor binding sites in case you don't know what transcription factor might be important for your cell condition. You just do the ataxy um, and, and based on the motif and the peak overlap with other transcription factor chip seek, figure out what transcription factor might be important for that cell condition. And there is a caution to call footprint, uh, but you could do motif analysis, peak analysis, and also recently, um, there are some you know, machine learning approaches to use a taxi and DNA data to predict which transcription factor binds in those locations. Um, and then in the last lecture, we talk about higher order chromatin organization or chromatin interactions. And so there are, sorry, different level of these chromatin interactions. The first level um, is more fine resolution is the chromatin loops. For example, the promoter has to loop to the enhancers through the transcription factor interaction with the PO2 in order to start the transcription process, right? So we can call these loops. Um, we can also call the uh, TAD domains like this, which, you know, basically within, say, a, a 200 base pair, sorry, 200,000 base pair region, you see a lot of interactions with each other in kind of a little blob in here. Uh, but then uh, they don't really interact a lot with a nearby blob. And so these usually are in the, so these um, loops usually happens within the TAD domain. Um, and so that's why uh, our regulator potential usually look at say 100 kb away because the, it's 100 kb away from upstream and 100 kb away from downstream. And so usually the chromatin domain is about 200, 250 kb along um, and a lot of interactions between but not so many interactions across. And then uh, another level is uh, based on the high C data, we can look at chromatin compartments. And so the, the bead heads are kind of repetitive sequence in the genome or not so active regions in the genome. Whereas the eight heads are, are kind of more active regions in the genome. And so um, 
And uh, we know that cohesin are, are important in you know, forming these chromatin domains. They're like motors to, to kind of examine the regions that are interesting. And very often um, in the TAT domain boundaries, we see the CTCF binding sites, and they are also called insulators in the genome. So to, to prevent the, the spreading of the histomarks or the effect of the one transcription factor to go from one TAT to the nearby TAT. And so the loop extrusion is just one model for how these chromatin domains and the TAD domains are established. Okay, so these are very important um, knowledge to understand how genes are regulated. And uh, as we mentioned, epigenetics and uh, transcription factor binding is kind of a chicken and egg problem they influence each other and they, of course, they all try to work together to influence nearby gene expression. And then we discuss hidden Markov models, right? So first there's the IID process, which are all independent. They have nothing to do with nearby sequence. Whereas Markov model is um, the state of one uh, particular time point depending on the, depends on the previous state, uh, time point state or maybe a second order or third order Markov. Uh, which it depends on the previous second, two, two or three uh, time points states. And uh, for, to understand uh, hidden Markov model, we need to understand the different um, elements, right? There is the uh, observations, you know, in a coin flip model, we have the head and tail of the coin. The hidden states are whether you're using fair coin or bias coin, um, and there are distinct uh, time points, right? And then for the hidden Markov model, we have the initial probability of picking a coin the transition probability of changing from one coin to the other, and the emission probability, which is the probability of seeing a head or tail based on the coin you have. And then um, we talk about three different problems. The first is, what's the probability of seeing a particular string of events happening? Um, and so we discussed the forward and backward procedure. Both are using the dynamic problem approach, trying to use the previous calculation to help with the next calculation. We can also try to infer the hidden states. What are the hidden uh, coins that we're using in order to see a particular string of, of coin flop of, of flip results? And so for that, we introduce the forward backward algorithm, which can give you a probabilistic guess at every state, at every time point. And also we discuss the Viterbi algorithm, which will give you the a, a one real path that will maximize the probability of seeing the particular coin flip. And also in, in reality, in bioinformatics problems, um, very often we don't really even know the parameters. And so we have to estimate the parameters and that's uh, similar to a EM algorithm. You do it iteratively. You start your hidden Markov model and you guess the path and you use the path to update the parameters and, and, and iterate. And so for bioinformatics, there are many good applications for hidden Markov model. You can use it to predict genes um, in the genome, to call copy number variations or call peaks in, you know, like these peaks or troughs in the genome. You can use it to analyze CPG islands in the genome, to identify the TAD boundaries to segment the genome for annotating them as promoters, enhancers, and insulators, or, um, and also to predict protein secondary structure. And so many, many useful applications. So that's the, the topic so far.